Hello everyone, um, my name is Alex Wood, I'm the Editor-in-Chief and Founder of The Memo and welcome to our panel on deep tech investing, pulling sci-fi towards reality. We have a fantastic group of investors and experts in the space and I'm going to jump right in and get started. And I think it's really important that we actually properly define and understand what deep tech investing is. Um, Fred, I'm going, to I'm going to turn to you and say, what does it mean to you? Because there's a lot of definitions here. Um, well, you have the... By the way, we're really in the hot seat today. Aren't we? we are, definitely. <laughs> um, I, I, so, you know, the, the science has been around forever. People were looking at uh, deep learning 20, 25 years ago. But I think what we're seeing now is with the advent of <coughs> TensorFlow processing and GPUs and the availability of, uh, availability of data, we're seeing that machine learning and approaches, again, where, where the science is quite mature, uh, have come into the mainstream. And so part of the issue in definition here is that it is extremely broad. It applies to pretty much every industry and every vertical. Um, and we, we have trouble categorizing it consistently. Uh, we're just seeing it as an enabler that drives a bunch of investment themes, particularly on the enterprise side. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm struggling to define it as a journalist myself. It's a term that is thrown into stories, but it's, it's definitely becoming a buzzword. Now, Siraj, you have experience in this space. You've created a business in the past with machine learning. From your perspective, what does it mean to you? Um, yeah, so, so my business, just uh, to, to recap, uh, we applied machine learning to the way crops are grown. And in doing so, we could help farmers increase their yield or decrease fertilizer use. Um, back then, you know, deep tech wasn't really a term people were using. But uh, to, to us at Atomico, where I am now as an investor, we, we look at deep tech at first, of course, as machine learning and some of the, the AI and some of the areas people think about uh, in, in terms of deep tech. But, but we also applied a little more broadly. So anything where there's algorithmic innovation going on, um, so whether that's the way you encode video, the way you, um, the way you, you identify, say, number plates in your computer vision application, um, to us that's all deep tech. So when we look at it, and we've just done a report that I can talk about a little later, uh, we look more broadly at uh, anything where there's algorithmic innovation at the core. Yeah. And, and Nathan, you, you have made a number of investments in this space as well. What does it mean to you? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, from the investing side, and I'm sort of drawing on my experience um, as a research scientist beforehand, and when I look at deep tech, I'm really thinking about research-led organizations, ones that are trying to push the boundaries, as Siraj was talking about, um, from the algorithmic side, but also from the data side, um, and that can be applied across healthcare, um, genomics, um, you know, industrial applications as well, and so... So yeah, so for us it has to have a component which is application, but where the end application is enabled by some new research which is pushing the boundaries of what was possible before in that, in that particular area. And um, Christoph, you, you're working with IBM Watson. What does it mean to a company like IBM? You're obviously very much in this space, but how do you make those boundaries? How are you defining what deep tech is to you? So deep tech, does, deep tech I would say, is, um, or we define it in the way that um, it's everything from, from computer science to life sciences and these kind of areas from en and energy, etc. It's where we have very complex problems actually to solve which current technologies haven't been cap able to, to do so yet. Um, and there we see a lot of potential in the areas of education, in the areas of engineering and, uh, and you know, healthcare and the medical industry where we have a, it's a very complex environment, very com complex infrastructure and deep technology has the ability to really drive disruption there and introduce new workflows and processes to enable real, real innovation in the future. And you've all mentioned this, this idea of different types of verticals, different kind of industries being disrupted. Now, do you see it very much as the newer tech players, the Googles of this world who are actually driving this? Or do you think some of the incumbents are actually going to manage to catch up with this and, and keep up and bring machine learning into the play? Yeah. I mean, I, I think in general what's very striking about this, this, um, the whole AI world is how aggressive Microsoft, Google, even Huawei with the partnership with UC Berkeley have been. So for example, Google has a hundred teams working on AI. I mean, a hundred teams. And that's not even talking about TensorFlow, yeah. uh, which is their, um, their AI uh, you know, chip framework that's been open sourced. So you see that on a horizontal basis, the giants are pushing 
very, very hard. Microsoft has made statements saying we want our whole cognitive infrastructure to be open to the world. You know, IBM is doing similar things. So I, I think for us, we see few opportunities as venture investors to go play horizontally. There are some, but you know, they're quite limited. However, if we find a sleeping giant in a vertical, say legal technology, where there's a bunch of listed companies that are worth a billion dollars, but their technology stack's like 20 years old, and they're nowhere near doing machine learning. You were talking about your girlfriend yeah. working at a law firm where they're doing yeah. e-signatures for the next three years. Yeah. Well, whilst they're doing e-signatures, by the way, we back DocuSign, so for us it's already like, you know, talk about a billion plus dollar company. Whilst they're busy doing e-signatures, we're building the next generation disruptors that are driven by machine learning. So what does that mean for law firms? Then? I mean, like, like you mentioned, we know there's a lot of law firms moving slowly. Are they going to get eaten alive? Well, so very practically, if you think about the, the law firm is a big pyramid structure with a lot of small hands doing paralegal work. Now, if we apply uh, artificial intelligence to writing contracts, we can tell people, look, here are 50 variations of the clause. We recommend these five. And by the way, you put the comma in the wrong place by using machine learning. So now you can imagine that these law firms, instead of being big pyramids, are going to become really narrow with all the, you know, very few people at the base uh, doing the basic services being repla replaced by machines, and then many fewer jobs for partners, for project managers, for relationship managers, and for the high value stuff being protected. But you know, all, everything that can be solved through software will be. Um, and I think that has profound implications, for example, for law firms and how they run, who they hire, how they operate. But do, do we think that consumers, let's say the kind of people who are using legal services, large businesses, are they ready to take that step? Do you think they actually realistically will move? I mean, the legal world is moving slowly. Are the customers going to move quickly? Now think about, think about what, how amazing it, think about how amazing it would be when, you know, everybody has access to, to legal support, right? Now it's a, it's a question of time, it's a question of, of money to actually have, find a good lawyer to really help you out of, of many different cases. More than 90% of cases statistically don't, don't even go to the court or somewhere else because people just don't know, people just don't have the resources to push them through. If we can make this, 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 um, this available to everybody out there, to the consumer out there, then this is a huge improvement in the, in, in the life. So let, let's, put a, let's put a hypothetical timeline on this. How quickly do you see an industry like the law industry changing? What's your view, Suresh? So, um, well, uh, even more broadly, the law industry, I'm going to stick out my neck here and make a prediction, which is every corporation of any consequence in 15 years will have AI uh, at its core, as a core enabler. I, I, I think most of us on stage are very confident about that. And that's not new companies necessarily. It includes companies that exist today that realize how big AI is and they're starting to turn their ship around. Um, like, like Google. I, I put Google in the old category of companies now. When we're thinking about which are the, these big behemoths, many of them are startups today or they're being founded. Um, you know, so yeah, 15 years I think we're, is, is a reasonable time frame in which we'll see um, this be broadly accepted. Of course, there will be a lot of progress for some companies before that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, uh, uh, more, more so than that, I would say, is um, beyond corporations, we're going to see a bunch of innovation within health tech. Our lifespans, all of us on this stage, um, all of us in this room, uh, will, will probably have our lifespans meaningfully improved by some of the work going on. It sounds like healthcare is an exciting space where things are already happening. Yeah. Nathan, you, you've, you've got some experience in this as yeah. well. What are we seeing in healthcare? Um, well, so I think, as we've seen in the consumer space, there's been a massive explosion in the data that's collected that describes um, you know, our preferences online and what we'd like to do. And in the medical space, you've seen that in the last five, ten years. Um, one of the big projects that, that I actually used when I was an academic was um, the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is this massive project that's sequencing hundreds of thousands of, uh, of patients who have different forms of, of cancer. And with that raw data set, um, with you know, innovations in computer science, we're being able to interrogate um, what that data actually means and trying to forecast um, what the driving factors are behind disease. And with that, we can find new ways to target them. And f further, further on from that, I think that you know, as you see more developments around wearable health, 
Um, I, I also think, like, my crazy prediction is we're going to have miniaturized sensors that can monitor our physiology, our behavior, um, and our predisposition from a genetic standpoint. And in the future, I don't see it as inconceivable to have a much more um, proactive healthcare system versus a reactive one, where we can start to forecast what's going on in our bodies and who's at risk of certain conditions. And if, if you believe that we can get there, um, we have a much higher chance of being able to stop diseases before they become incurable, which is the biggest cost to the healthcare system, is people showing up when their disease is too advanced, and we can't repair a car that's like, entirely damaged. Um, so that, that's something that I'm really excited about. You, you were saying earlier to me, I think it's... Were you describing about Alzheimer's and the way that it can be diagnosed in hospitals at the moment yeah. is, did you say with a ruler? It, it yeah, can be yeah, that simplistic. Yeah, yet. exactly. We were talking about that with, with Fred as well earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Like the state of the art is essentially a digitized ruler where, where you're um, uh, measuring brain features uh, on a scan and then trying to figure out how that correlates with outcome. And similarly, when you're trying to diagnose breast cancer, you're also trying to look at a really complex black and white image and try and see where one part of the image looks, looks strange, and there's a certain amount of experience that a human can possibly aggregate during their lifetime by reading textbooks and seeing examples, but if you aggregate together the entirety of the world's knowledge in a computer, then in theory you should be able to perform far better than that single individual. And that, that, that kind of change sounds incredible, but again, how far away is it? Is this something tangible? Are people going to be experiencing this kind of technology soon? I mean, the, the example of, um, the, example of the, the ruler brain scan is happening today. So this is a company that basically says, I'm going to take three million brain scans from a, a, an, an array of libraries, and I, I'm going to enable a doctor in India to access a cloud service where he can send a brain scan and get proper imaging analysis done and sent back instead of, uh, you know, effectively not being able to diagnose effectively or, like, Nathan said having to measure in centimeters the size of a brain compression, which is insane. So I think this is a company, this is a Techstars company we were mentioning that is live today in research centers. So I, I think this stuff is, is here and now, which is the reason why we're investing. I mean, as investors, as VCs, if we get market timing wrong, we're dead. Like, we can be as smart as we want, but if we're five, five years too early, we never make any money. So part of the challenge for us is always finding inflection points, and we think the inflection point for AI is here today, which is... Te you mentioned Techstars. Is that Techstars here in Europe or over in the States? And this is a Techstars London company, yeah. Okay, and, and let's talk a bit about the European dimension here. So where is Europe fitting into this? Are we leading? Are we following the valley again? Um, yeah, that's a really good question, and, you know, uh, so Slush and Atomico, this is a report we just released yesterday. I, I mean, this, it's much more than us, frankly. Um, I, I think, Fred, you're, you're quoted in there. There's, there's uh, a lot of um, industry luminaries that are in here, but we've got data together from LinkedIn, from Stack Overflow, from direct um, surveys of developers. And um, when it comes to deep tech, this is very encouraging, actually. What we've, what we've seen is deep tech, we're, we're actually ahead of the curve. You know, Europe has often punched below its weight in, in venture and in startups, and that's not the case here. And uh, if you were to ask most people in the industry what is the most interesting company in deep tech today, most of them would probably say DeepMind, which is a London-based company. It's now been acquired by Google, but... Uh, retains its independence, is building out of London, and a lot of, it's become this mighty oak, and around this, these shoots of AI companies are starting to grow. But, but so when what, it comes to deep am... tech, um, we, you know, in terms of funding, you know, we're 2.3 billion into companies in the last couple of years, uh, 4.1 million developers in Europe, um, and a lot of real deep uh, tech innovation, specifically because of the great universities we have, yeah. and some of the academic research. Um, just really quickly, I, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but pe the professors considered the fathers of AI, Jeff Hinton, Jan LeCun, uh, Zubin Garmani, these are actually Europeans. Some of them are not in Europe anymore, but they're Europeans, and some of their grad students are the leading lights um, now around which new companies are starting to grow. And do we think that we have the right ecosystem here in Europe to support these kind of companies, or are we going to see a repeat of previous history when companies get eaten up by the Americans and go over? Or are we going to support them this time? From a, from a 
from a research system, from, from a research perspective, when you look, take the example of healthcare again, right? We have a very sophisticated healthcare system in Europe, so there's lots of data, there's a lot of research being done. It's well connected to the to the universities and other educational institutions and research organizations. So from that perspective, I think we're well positioned to do that. On the other hand, it draws back to all the same to the, all the same legacy issues that we have in terms of scaling, in terms of you know getting out into the market, getting in front of the customers, you know regulations that are sometimes or very often you know limiting the abilities to to get something out there and 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 make it happen and prove the concept basically. So I, I think look, I think it's going to be a real challenge per usual to for the venture industry, so all of us here to demonstrate that we're willing to take the early risk on foundational technology and not force the entrepreneurs to move to the Bay Area because they're like, fuck, nobody wants to take a risk on me, I'm going west. So I think the challenge is ours. Thankfully, Atomico's new fund, you know, Playfair and Nathan, us, you know, IBM Ventures, I mean, I think we have enough people that are willing to take risks, but I mean, historically, we haven't done it. So now, let's see if we're, if we're better able to do it, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really important point, and um, Fred's pointing in the right direction. Um, there's, at least for us at the seed stage, there's really few people who want to take crazy outlandish bets on science projects, essentially when that's what they look like at the start. Um, and, and I think there's, there's enough great people now who are talking um, the right language and, and indicating significant interest that I think it's going to change. And if anything, if we look at the broader AI space um, in the UK, um, you can see that actually the amount of money that was invested in um, venture funded companies this year is the same than the sum of the former four years before it. Um, and before 2010, um, there was really no significant capital invested in the space at all. We're still lagging the U.S. by about seven to ten times in terms of number of companies and amount of money. But the momentum is certainly happening in the U.K. And, uh, you know, as Suraj was talking about, DeepMind is, I, I do think, a watershed moment uh, in, in the AI space broadly. And we're just so lucky to have it in our backyard. So I think the... the the reticence to start um, hard tech companies in, in Europe as a spin out from academia is starting to change and, and more and more um, academics are actually taking that route and there are people around the table who are happy to take bets on them. And I, I really want to expand on your view as a seed investor. How yeah. are you able to look into the future and actually look at something which is very conceptual at yeah. that stage? How do you find that, um, that golden startup? What are you looking for? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly don't profess to be able to, to see the future, but you know, I, I read into the same trends than, <clears throat> than others do. And, um, and I would take a, a, a bit more of a research focus on things. So I'm, I'm constantly going through academic literature to see where the state of the art is and trying to forecast out how if you, if you manage to solve um, you know, a core research problem and you take it for granted that some of the infrastructure components exist, what could you do? Um, and I remember reading um, through the history of Google and that was uh, you know, a very similar thesis too, which is you know, if you can solve the world's information, what can you do with that? Um, and I think we've seen some, some great companies emerge in, in healthcare and video compression and others by, by looking at those trends and expanding it in the future. And so one area in particular uh, in machine learning right now is how do you apply it to creative industries? Um, and this has been um, sort of a, a fringe of work over the last couple of years, but now we can really see that you can create music entirely from scratch. And there's Ed Rex from Juke Deck, he'll be talking today about that. Um, and there's ways that you can generate text from scratch, you can write press releases, um, you can start to um, colorize black and white images, you can transfer a style from one artist um, to an image that was taken by, um, by a camera and, and, and painted as if it was created by the artist, so I think these are all fringe projects, but that will expand in a in a in a new so area. So when you when you were listing through all those examples, you're starting to make me worry because it sounds like maybe I'm not going to have a job in the future. <laughs> and it, we've been very positive so far. I think we've talked about a lot of the potential, but I think it's maybe good to balance things out a bit and talk maybe about the morality and some of the potential downsides. I mean. Looking back earlier this year, we had the Microsoft chatbots. We had Tay, which I think in less than 24 hours, it um, became racist, sexist, and uh, a Nazi supporter, I think. It was, it's incredible how quickly technology can turn bad. Are there any downsides, and what can we do to make sure that we avoid the pitfalls? Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. I think we, as technologists, sometimes we're a little too rosy about the future, and it's our responsibility to also think about how do we prevent some of the negative outcomes. The reality is, you know, we're building essentially super intelligence here, right? We're building these black boxes that are better than any human being at looking at data and saying this person has cancer or this person doesn't, or um, you know, driving cars, uh, but the uh, and maybe making 
things, uh, decisions that are changing people's lives, like does this person get parole or not? Does this person get a credit score that's here or here? And when these are black boxes, then it's very hard for you to know, uh, A, if something goes wrong, that something is wrong, and how do you debug it, but B, what are the biases that are being built into this box? Is it racist? You know, is it, is it doing things that are socially unacceptable? Um, and, uh, you know, it's an open question. I think there, the good news is uh, companies like DeepMind, for example, um, uh, Demis there, uh, the founder, has put together a group that is thinking about the ethics of AI. The, uh, you know, it's not something the industry is, is, is not looking at, yeah. but there are plenty of open questions around it. And I, my, my, um, my primary concern here is that if you think robotics changed manufacturing, think about how AI is going to change services jobs and how many of them are going to get destroyed. I mean, realistically, everybody who talks about implementing AI is talking about saving humans. I mean, I mean saving humans, I mean not having to employ humans. And so you think about bank middle office, claims processing, writing legal contracts. So historically we said, oh, you know, we should all be in the services business because that's where the jobs are. And now we're going to have a wave of, I think, large-scale job disruption, destruction in services that will be fast and furious because everybody will want to scale through tech. And as, as an investor, do you feel that you have a responsibility to humanity if there are no jobs? It's well, so I think fundamentally, um, I mean, at a philosophical level, I don't think it's that interesting to be in claims processing, right? So I'm not going to make judgment calls as to technology historically has replaced jobs and we're not working the earth because we have technology. That's where I'm positive around the impact of tech. I think at a societal level, the problem is the speed of change. You know, this is like closing the minds, but applied to every vertical. So now we have an entire generation of people where you know, they can stay at home and all watch reality TV all day, so which is why you have to look at inequality and redistribution, and you know, uh, I, I think it's a major societal problem, but I think that's primarily a political problem. I don't think we can stop tech, you know, that is, it's just not going to happen, and I'm a believer in the, in the powerful impact of tech on human lives in general, but I think we just have to look at what it's going to do in terms of destroying our societies, and this is fundamentally a political question. We are apolitical as technologists. I think we have to watch you know, that hell is paved with good intentions and that the technology sector just has no morality in general. Uh, you know, we just, we're all about efficiency, we're all about scaling, we're all about making more money, and you know, uh, we sort of have to reintegrate a political and community discourse into that, because otherwise we're going we're gonna to fuck ourselves up. The, I'd say, I would say it's... I would say it's not only the, you know, the responsibility of, of the thought leaders and the large tech companies or the leading players in the market, it's also the responsibility outside of, let's say, these 50,000 tech people in the world or 100, let's be 100,000 to, to spread the word about it to make, and to make the rest of the world, the people, aware so that they, everybody should play an active role in the change in, 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 the, in, you know, in, in the society. So it's, it's changing from, you know, the governments and everybody else tries to take care of the people into a world where, of course, personalization and, you know, scalability of products and services, you know, also requires that everybody has to play an active role in that world. That we, you know, there's no government in the, in the future that will take care of us anymore because it's not working that way anymore. We can't have personalization on the one hand and, and somebody else taking part, care of our lives on the other. And therefore, we need to bring this, from my point of view, out into the world to say, okay, guys, how, how does this affect our lives and what can everybody do on a personal level to understand it and to have a positive impact? Have any of you, I'm curious to know, ever had a deck or a pitch given to you and you thought, this is too much, I, this is going to have a negative impact? Could you share an example? I'm curious to know, as an investor, have you, have you seen anything in this space? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't, but I think Fred made this really good point, which is whether or not we pick a company and invest in it, someone else will. You know, the only constant uh, is change itself. Technology will progress, and uh, you know, it's whether or not we invest. It, it's not our role to say, you know, we're going to step back here. Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't think the problems that would be introduced by this technology are going to be solved by not doing it. It's going to be more societally, we have this major cultural shift we need to make um, towards what do we do in, in a world where 
a lot of knowledge work is now replaced. Uh, but WALL-E is, is a great film, right? It's a really subversive movie. It's about this future where people don't do anything anymore. They just watch television, eat, and you know, move around on these pedestals. Um, that's not a world we want to end up in. But um, no, you can see how we would get there if we're not careful uh, as a society. And um, we're just coming up to our last couple of minutes, and I think it would be really interesting if I could just go around to each of you and just hear what's the one area of deep tech that you're most excited about for the next 12 months. I'm going to start with you, Fred. Yeah, so I, I think, um, as I expressed before, we're, we're really focused on vertical applications of machine learning and, and AI. So our, our last two investments, so one is in, for example, the insurance industry, to help people understand from millions of claims how to abstract this into common English and say, oh, we see a network of people collaborating around um, producing insurance claims uh, or fraud that would not have been detected by humans. So we're looking at this in insurance tech, in legal tech, and we're, we're looking at these segments where we can use AI as a wedge to get into these large corporations like AXA Insurance, and then from there build very broad platforms that are AI enabled, so we can sort of power you know, it's like insurance as a service or legal as a service powered by AI. And I think that's our primary focus right now. Suraj? Um, so for, for us, it's, you know, again, similar looking at verticals that are interesting. Um, just to, to add to that, uh, I think ag tech, agriculture is particularly interesting. We cannot feed 10 billion people by 2050 using conventional mechanisms. Uh, a lot of the advances will be using computer vision and machine learning to say, well, this is how you've got to grow your crops better based on all these inputs. Uh, that's one. Um, uh, MedTech, obviously, Nathan will speak a little more about that. Um, and then uh, just more broadly, personal assistance. And how do we actually have startups succeed there and not just Google and Apple become the default winners? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about um, problems which we, we, we couldn't solve before because we didn't have the right infrastructure, the right algorithms, data, models. Um, so touched a little bit on creativity. Um, I, th I think we're going to see a wave of, uh, of amazing projects there. Um, in healthcare, trying to predict outcomes of, of patients and help diagnosis. Um, and, uh, and yeah, those are, the, those are the main ones, to be honest. Being, being biased from, from IBM, of course, but it's also... The very interesting part for me is that how can we understand people better in terms of personality, in terms of intent, in terms of tone. And this can be from a natural language point of view to also to computer or machine vision point of view. Um, and then, of course, industry-wise, it's, as we said, healthcare is one of the biggest topics, uh, but it goes also into biotech and genomics, where, you know, when we, you mentioned, you know, what is, what is the limit before artificial bodies, right? You know, this is something where, where, where we're heading to, but although we are... Um, afraid mostly of, of aliens, we're still not stopping to discover them. So I think it's the same with this type of technology. Brilliant. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. Um, I know we're getting very warm by this fire. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us and a very exciting view of the future. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, guys.